I am a research software engineer from the uh, central team at Newcastle University. And uh, most of the projects that I seem to find myself working on are relatively small projects. A lot of what I do is, you know, three to six months projects, uh, half FTE. I'm the only engineer on the project working with PIs who are not necessarily very technically adept people. Uh, and so in most of those cases, I tend not to do a lot of project management because there's not really a huge amount of points. Obviously, I use GitHub. I'm not a monster. Um, and I do occasionally uh, use GitHub issues to track um, various things. But uh, for the most part, I tend not to do a huge amount of uh, that kind of um, project management stuff. Uh, but last year, I got the opportunity to join the uh, Coloring Cities project, and this is a much larger project with a lot of different collaborators all over the world. And so that required a certain amount of uh, project management in order to keep everything uh, running smoothly and under control. And for the first time, we've been able to do pretty much all of the project management for the entire project right. yeah. uh, using uh, GitHub. So what I thought I would do today is just give you a brief summary of the Coloring Cities project uh, and tell you a little bit about my contribution to that. Um, but I also thought I would uh, tell you a little bit about some of the GitHub features that we've used to manage the projects and give you a sort of mini review of them and whether or not uh, I think they're worth your time. Some of these are features that you may have used before, um, but I've chatted to a few of my colleagues and it seems um, a few of them hadn't used quite a lot of these features yet either. And some of the features have been updated or changed in the last few months. So hopefully um, some of this information will be useful to you. And if not, hopefully the uh, Coloring Cities project itself will be at least of uh, some interest. So the Coloring Cities project began a few years ago with uh, Coloring London. Coloring London basically became the prototype for the platform. Uh, and the idea was to create um, a single online open platform to collect data about buildings in London. So we collect all sorts of data from a range of different sources. We access uh, council and other free sources that are technically open and available, but not necessarily all that easy to actually access. Import those into the platform. Then we've got some live streaming data. So we've got a lot of planning data from local councils that we are live streaming into this tool. And then finally, uh, we've added the ability to do crowdsourcing. So uh, volunteers can come in and fill information about their homes, their buildings, their neighborhoods, that sort of thing, all into this sort of one central uh, platform. And say it began with uh, Coloring London a few years ago, with the project being led by Polly Hudson uh, at the Turing. Uh, it was originally developed by Tom Russell, and then there have been a few other engineers who've worked on it before me. Fortunately, managed to persuade the PI to get invested in the whole GitHub thing. So I want to say a huge thank you to Tom Russell, to Ed, who may or may not be here, and uh, a couple of other uh, developers who are around um, as well. So the idea is to say we put all of this data into the single platform. We're working on uh, building a better API to sort of export data if you want it to go and do your own analysis. But mainly what the platform does at the moment is uh, allow you to explore and visualize that data. So we've got um, a dozen different categories, lots of different subcategories and various different uh, data types that we collect. Uh, and you can click around and explore on this map. And we color the map differently depending on what data you're looking at. So in this example, we're looking at land use, uh, whereas here we're looking at age and history. And I, can, I already suspect that a lot of you are thinking this, we are already working on doing things like trying to improve the sort of color blindness and accessibility of these color features because they are not currently great. But it allows us to um, say visualize and explore uh, all of this data about the buildings uh, in the city of London. And the, the project uh, has been uh, fairly successful. It, uh, it, could have, it could have died, as many uh, RSC projects do. It could have, you know, we tend to write some software, some science gets done, a paper gets published, and then our code goes away to sit on some dusty server in the back of GitHub somewhere, never to be seen again. Um, but in this case, we already had uh, a number of partners. Uh, I think it was Columbia and Australia had already started their own coloring projects spinning off from Coloring London. So the project was doing really well, and it meant that we got some more funding, which is always good. Uh, and now we are expanding the platform to work with a number of different partners. So there are, let's say, people in different countries all over the world who are doing their own coloring, whatever city or color project. Uh, and so we're trying to adapt the platform uh, to accommodate um, all of these people. And so I joined the project, to say, about 18 months ago, and my job has been to oversee this transition from the Coloring London prototype to what we're calling the Coloring Cities core platform. 
uh, which is, and the idea is to create a single sort of shared code base used by all of the coloring uh, projects. Everyone can contribute to it. Everyone can um, benefit from uh, each other's work. The theory, at least, is that um, if Germany adds language translations, Indonesia can use the same code to add language translations into their um, tools and by collaborating and working together, because most of the partners that we're working with, there's a single PI and a single RSE working half time on the project. So we really do have to pull uh, resources uh, and effort together. The reality is not quite there yet. We do have people developing different uh, uh, versions in different places, and we're now trying to all pull it back together. But we are hoping that this will give us a platform that is, as I say, constantly expanding and evolving thanks to the collaboration from these various different partners. Um, and it, and it, <clears throat> excuse me, and it could also potentially allow the projects to continue to exist, even if the funding for Colouring London fails, someone else could take over and the project itself um, could continue. We also have ambitions uh, to expand beyond that, so we're hoping to move on to Colouring Britain, looking first at England, Wales, of course, Scotland and the rest of the UK, uh, and that map gives you a sort of idea of this, you can't really see very well, but you've got, we've got the Greater London area that we're currently modelling and we're hoping to uh, expand out to the rest of the UK, which has its own challenges, of course, but we've got new partners coming on board from Loughborough, possibly some colleagues uh, from Newcastle getting involved to create these regional hubs and help us grow and expand. And it's been sort of my job to oversee that sort of transition. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we had to do in a minute before I um, move on. But first, if you want to know any more about the Colouring Cities project, you can contact me. I'm not a geomatics person. I hate to say this in this conference of all places. I'm just the RSE working on the project. But if you have any technical questions, you contact me and I will do my best to help you. Or you can contact Polly, who is in charge of the project. And if you go to coloringcities.org, that gives you information about the wider project and all of the current uh, international partners currently working with us. So yeah, my main contribution to this project has been uh, taking Colouring London and turning it into this new Colouring Core platform, uh, making it as configurable as possible to reduce the amount of custom code that everyone has to write when they want to spin up their new versions of it, uh, managing that, doing the documentation and adding new features to the core platform that we think will be useful to everyone, as well as uh, adding new features that are London specific to Colouring London and trying to work out what, what goes where and manage all of that sort of thing. And we've just done a, a fairly major update to the UI to try and make it more user-friendly and capture more data, particularly about the sources of data that, uh, where people are providing uh, stuff to us. We want them to obviously um, give us their sources as much as possible. And that's um, all been going rather well. Um, so in terms of actually managing that transition, just to give you an idea of some of the stuff that we've been working on, um, Yes, I'm going to uh, go through some of the changes that I've been making and talk a little bit about, as I say, most, pretty much all of the project management has been done via GitHub. And I want to go through some of the features that we use and talk about how we, we use them to manage uh, that transition process. So firstly, working with repositories, again, be nothing new, hopefully, to most of you, but we had to... Uh, hang on, I will show you this actually first because this makes more sense. So uh, what we originally had was the Colouring London prototype and a couple of other people had already forked off from that. Uh, and we wanted to change the structure, but we wanted to sort of keep that existing structure intact. So what we ended up doing was restructuring our GitHub organization. So Colouring London was renamed to Colouring Core and that became the core platform and we took all the London specific stuff out of it and then we created a new Colouring London as a fork from that, which has then got all of the Colouring London specific stuff put back in it. Um, and this actually did work surprisingly well. You think renaming repositories would break everything. It didn't. GitHub is quite good at managing things like redirections. If you do rename your GitHub repo, uh, so you can rest assured that you're probably not going to break everything if you do this. Um, uh, the, the problem then was because, because we'd renamed Colouring London to Colouring Core and then we had a new Colouring London, of course, the uh, the redirects weren't working because there was now a new thing that was linked to and we had a bit of admin and kerfuffle to deal with all that, but um, we were able to sort of successfully uh, transition. The only thing that I would note that we did notice was sometimes when you fork from a project, if you don't set your settings up correctly, you can accidentally end up checking your code into the main branch on the upstream repository and that does break everything. So be careful uh, that you don't do that. Um, yeah, there we go. Come on, the same thing. Uh, then, of course, we have issues. I do a longer version of this talk where I explain what issues are, but I hope I don't have to do that in this particular context. Uh, as I say, I've used issues before on projects, but it's mainly as a sort of to-do list for myself. 
But in this case, uh, we the PI has access to GitHub, as do all of the other international PIs and other RSEs. So we've been trying to uh, use them uh, sort of in a, in a better way, the way they're actually intended to be used. So we've made use of uh, tags and things so that we can easily filter. Uh, we've used projects, which I'm going to be mentioning in a minute. Uh, and um, we found that this has been really good for having discussions and feedback about the issues. Everything's in GitHub. So it's not like I create a GitHub issue and then suddenly I have to go and find an email chain from the PI where they've asked for a hundred different things and it's all scattered all over the place. Having everything centralized in GitHub has been uh, really helpful and really useful. Um, I'm choosing my words carefully because I suspect the PI might watch this video at some point in the future. Um, the, I will say get having the PI access to GitHub uh, does have its advantages and disadvantages. Um, it is really good to be able to engage with them on the platform and get all of that information in one place. It means there's a lot less uh, issue creation for me going through emails and creating these issues, but it does mean I have to do some triage and making sure that we avoid uh, duplicates and, uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, using them properly in this context with a much larger team has worked um, remarkably well. And we move on to projects. Some of you will probably have used GitHub projects before. You may or may not be aware that it's been updated in the last sort of 18 months or so. So there is now a new version uh, of GitHub projects. Uh, again, we found that this works really well for organizing things and using it as a sort of um, agenda for having meetings with the PI. So we have, I hope you can see them, uh, a range of different categories. So as well as to do in progress and uh, done, we have a, a more information required. Those are for the tasks often that the PI has created without necessarily explaining exactly what they meant. Uh, so we've, we can collect them all together in one place and uh, sort them out there. Help required was for some issues that I can't solve myself, but some of the other developers who've previously been involved in the project are still around uh, and can help out. So we collect them together. And uh, yeah, so organizing the projects like this uh, really has helped um, managing things. Weirdly, some of these things have to be enabled when you first create a new GitHub repository, which I'm not sure why, because to me, they're sort of fairly core to the um, the workings. Uh, yes, and the so the new revamped version of GitHub projects uh, means that previously you would have a project attached specifically to a repository, and it was a sort of part of that repository, whereas now projects exist separately, which means that it's more of a path to get it set up and working. But on a project like ours, where we have got multiple repos from different people all over the world, and we want to manage all of that stuff in one place, it means we can connect that project uh, to multiple repos. And that does work quite well. As I said, it works really well, particularly that project view as a, an agenda for sorting meetings. And there are some really good built-in automation. So it, just things like dragging a thing into the done column will close the issue, that sort of thing. You can set all kinds of stuff up like that. Uh, and that has been fairly useful. Again, may not be um, super new to some of you, but hopefully uh, that has worked uh, genuinely really well. The next thing that we tried to use was uh, discussions. You may have seen this again. Uh, again, these have to be turned on, but you can have discussions at the repository level or at the sort of organization level. And we have used these to try and make sure that whenever we deploy a new version of the core platform and we want everyone to update, um, we can make announcements in this um, particular thread. Um, in reality, uh, this hasn't been used as much as I thought. I thought it would be a really good way to communicate, particularly with um, partners in other time zones uh, all over the world. But in reality, uh, there hasn't been a lot of engagement. We have had a few people who can't create issues have come in and uh, reported bugs getting the um, system up. So they have been uh, vaguely useful, but um, perhaps uh, not as widely used as we would have liked. Uh, and finally, I talk a little bit about automation. So hopefully some of you have had some encounters with GitHub Actions. Again, I didn't set this up. Uh, some of one of my predecessors did, and I am very grateful to them for doing so. We have a few uh, automation features that we use uh, in Coloring Cities. So firstly, we have coloringcities.org. The website is a static website hosted on GitHub Pages, which is brilliant because it's free. Uh, and we have it set up so that whenever we submit code to that, it automatically gets deployed and updated again be familiar to, to some of you, but that is a really useful and powerful feature, particularly when you're developing prototypes and you don't yet, you're not yet ready to pay for hosting. GitHub pages I can definitely recommend. Uh, I'll skip ahead actually. So we uh, we also use a thing called uh, Dependabot, which again, I've never seen before, but it's a sort of, it's a bot, funnily enough, that uh, monitors the dependencies on your projects and it automatically says, oh, this version of your repository, uh, this version of one of your dependencies is out of date. So it automatically creates a pull request to bump it up to the latest, uh, more secure version, which is mostly helpful. Uh, 
as I'm sure some of you know, uh, updating dependencies can cause knock-on problems. Most of the time, it's fine. <laughs> but just occasionally the depender bot will update a dependency and it will uh, break everything. But that's where we have the uh, automated testing features. So we have some build scripts that automatically get run whenever any code is merged onto the main branch. Um, it runs through a series of these scripts which do a basic build process. And this has often caught bugs before we then try to deploy it onto the production server and uh, everything breaks. So I can say definitely recommend looking into uh, GitHub Actions and uh, particularly this uh, automated um, build step that gets kicked off when uh, ever everything gets checked in. Uh, so I think I'm actually running slightly ahead, unusually. We might, we might be able to get back on schedule. Uh, um, so yes, uh, in general, so this is the first time I have used, I've used external project management tools before on various other projects. This is the first time we've done it all using GitHub, and I say it has re worked remarkably well uh, there has been some. Uh, I don't know how difficult it was to get the PI initial, the the main PI originally invested, but um, getting them involved has been really good to have this centralized discussion of all of the issues and everything uh, in one place. Um, we had to do some onboarding with some of the other PIs who have joined the project, but they genuinely are keen to be involved, particularly when they see uh, how active the discussions are and how every how everything is how well everything is going and how everything is being discussed uh, all in one place. So yeah, that was a very brief run through of the uh, Coloring Cities project and my experience of using GitHub to manage uh, that project. Um, these slides are available through programs. So if you want to check through and download them, you can get to all of the links here and say, if you want to contact me or Polly, uh, you can or go to coloringcities.org. Uh, thank you. So you have. Thank you very much, Mike. We're just gonna bring up the Slido and start going through some questions. So the, uh, yeah, we'll just go by order of sort of upvote. So uh, I feel like we don't often talk about usage of features in GitHub, like issues and projects, but it's interesting to hear specifically how others implement them. Do you think there is value in take talking more about this and not assuming we are all already using them in the best way? Yes, I definitely think so. And I've certainly, I've worked on, I have worked on some of the different projects with other RSCs, and I know there are other people who, just because the technology exists and is intended to be used in one way, RSCs can always find ways to <laughs> use them in completely wild and different uh, and creative ways. Uh, and there's been, I know there's been a lot of talk sort of generally about project management in RSE and how do can we apply the same sort of principles from business to RSE, which I'm not personally not sure we can because the point of RSA is that we're supposed to be more flexible and work more collaboratively with researchers and so on. But yeah, I think um, I say I found them generally useful and powerful. There were things that I'd not used before. I know some of my colleagues uh, hadn't used them before and hopefully at least some people in this room uh, hadn't and found that interesting. So yeah, I think it's could be something to add to that ongoing discussion about project management in RSA. Great, thanks. So we have a question, uh, what's your release strategy and how do you manage this? Um, in theory, <clears throat> we, uh, so we have a, we've got two servers, we've got a, a staging server and a production server. So I work locally on a virtual machine on my machine where everything's ready, I check all the code in, it gets deployed to the uh, staging server where we can then test it with the PI and make sure that she's happy with everything. We can get other people to come in and test it, make sure that there are no problems before we then deploy to the production server. Uh, in reality, I do occasionally get an email going, oh, we're demoing this with this next week. Can you quickly get it onto production? Which I don't like doing because I want to make sure that everything works before uh, I deploy it. But that's um, currently uh, how it works. We are looking into ways to automate some of these deployments because at the moment I'm sort of manually logging into the server, pulling and building locally and running it. Um, we do have plans to um, help automate that at some point. Sorry if I missed this, what was and the, the sort of frequency around that maybe? Is, uh, is there a regular um, uh, or no, is it just not, not, We're not sort of working to uh, regular deadlines. It tends to be, oh, there's a conference coming up. Can we get a new version out before that? Um, yeah, fair enough. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so this, this is quite interesting. I was, I was wondering about this myself. Uh, have you got any advice on using discussions for building your community? Or is the value you've gotten out of it quite limited? So you, you did sort of mention maybe limited, but yeah, please expand. 
Yes. So we were we were hoping to get more engagement out of them than we than we did. Uh, we there is already an existing Coloring London discussion forum, which is hosted on a separate website that was set up when the original Coloring London project started. That has had quite a lot of engagement, and there are quite a few people who have been volunteers who've been putting uh, data into the system. A few of them uh, <laughs> complained when we took away the link to that forum and linked to GitHub instead. Um, but no, we're say. I was I was sort of hoping that I would be able to make an announcement and sort of ping everyone within the Coloring Cities organization and tell them there's a new version available, please download it, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. But no, uh, it hasn't worked as well as as we hoped, um, which is unfortunate. I'm not sure. There are probably ways to improve engagement, but um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Next question. Uh... How does Dependabot work? Uh, does it automatically test on new versions of dependencies? Do you have control over whether you use these new versions of dependencies? Yes. So again, this this was set up before uh, before I joined, so I'm not sure exactly how it works. But every so often, uh, a pull request appears, just saying, "Oh, um, such and such dependency version 1.3.7 is now um, sort of." I think it happens when there's actually a security vulnerability rather than just a new version of uh, the thing. And so it says our oh, version 1.3.9 is secure. So it automatically creates a pull request that updates the JSON file with the dependencies in it. And uh, then you have the choice, of course, whether you actually do merge that um, pull request in. Uh, and then you say, I've got the automated testing stuff to make sure that it doesn't break too much. Um, yep, great. Yeah, it, it is a useful, useful tool to have enabled and you get it quite easily for free. Yeah. Um, I think we'll just do one more question because you did finish a bit early even though the, the sort of five minute question period is up but I'll, okay. maybe we can get through these <laughs> um how configurable is coloring core do i need to take a fork and add lots of extra features or is there a lot of stuff i could configure out of the box yes uh, so that is a very good question that is something we are we are working on uh so i say originally coloring london was just developed as its own prototype we didn't know if we were going to get any additional funding whether that was going to be it so we didn't put too much effort into making it configurable in the first place which <laughs> um, we are now working on that. So uh, we have, uh, I've implemented a single config file that lets you sort of specify, for example, the city name, the latitude and longitude where the camera starts when the uh, on the map when the application loads zoom level uh, and links to various GitHub things. I'm trying to make it so that it's as, as configurable as possible and all the things you need to change are in a small number of places instead of having to sort of do a find and replace for the word London in the entire uh, code base uh, and replacing it. Uh, it's definitely something we're, we're working on. It's a, a priority for all these new international partners coming on board. Great. And there was one question there about how uh, that was a bit longer. Oh, yeah, about how Project View helped with meeting agendas. Maybe we just uh, touch on that quickly and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Uh, yes. So uh, as you will have seen, we've got all these different sort of categories that we've been putting the uh, the um, issues into and uh, the one that's been particularly useful that I didn't mention because I didn't want to uh, dwell on it for too long we have a um, a um, sort of awaiting confirmation category so there's an extra category of like okay these issues are done but I want the PI to actually physically sign off on them to say that she's happy with them before we actually class them as done uh, and that's what we tend to do in most of the meetings is go through that list of you know here's all the stuff I've done this week um, uh, are you happy with it and it's also been good for sort of highlighting ones where that we need to discuss and where we need uh, more information. Great. Thanks. Sounds like a good strategy. Uh, I think we will call it there just to enable people to switch rooms if they want to and others to come in. Uh, we'll have a sort of quick five minutes to, to do that. Thank you very much, Mike. Please, everyone join me in thanking our speaker. <laughs>